Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. South Africa has a long history of protest, going way back to the old anti-apartheid marches that predated our democracy. Back then, few of us would have guessed that our fellow countrymen would still be engaged in protest action 20 years after achieving democracy. In fact, South Africans are protesting so much that our country has been dubbed the protest capital of the world. In recent years especially, there has been a wave of protest action. Many of these protests originate in poor communities. One tragic development is that as protests have increased, so too has police brutality. Protesters often come up against heavily armed police, leading to tragic outcomes. Just in the first month of January 2014, police were responsible for the deaths of at least eight protesters, the media reported. Why are people protesting? Are their protests simply about frustration regarding the lack of services that they receive? Or is there something more fundamental that they are protesting about? Is there something more fundamental about our democracy that needs to be addressed? Is this recent wave of protest part of a wider global trend in protest and civil disobedience, which we've seen a growth of throughout the world? A new global study that examined protests between 2006 and 2013 in 87 countries, including South Africa, found that the highest number of protests take place in the developed world and the main grievance of protesters is economic injustice. Researchers in South Africa have also conducted research on protests in this country. Researchers at the University of Johannesburg have tracked protests specifically from the period 2004 to 2013 and we're going to be talking to one of them today, Trevor Nguane. Trevor is going to help us make sense of the protests in South Africa. Trevor is a researcher in social change and a doctoral student working in informal settlement committees. He's also the political education and research officer of the Soweto Electricity Crisis Committee. Welcome to Saxes, Trevor. Thank you. <laughs> Trevor, I want to start off our conversation this morning by contextualizing what's happening in South Africa within the broader global context. Um, as I noted in my introduction, there's been a, an increase in global protests. And I, I want to read something from a report that I read about um, these international protests. The report states, Following the onset of the global financial and economic crisis, there is a major increase in protests beginning 2010 with the adoption of austerity measures in all world regions. Is South Africa part of this global wave? What's driving the protests here in South Africa? Uh, yes, Fazila, I think South Africa is very much part of the global social and economic order. And in fact, what has happened since we, we got our independence, we've become even more integrated into the global financial and economic circuits, which means that the problems of the global capitalist economy hit us very hard. And you are correct to say that in 2008, uh, there was an economic meltdown throughout the world. But that meltdown uh, found a Europe, a USA, a world already struggling with uh, economic problems. So, for example, already in France in 2005, there were protests, you know, by young people, by uh, workers, as austerity measures started to bite. Also in Greece, uh, we saw the England riots, uh, Spain, and it's all about the burdens of the capitalist crisis being transferred onto the shoulders of the working poor, of the working class. And people are finding you know, reasons to fight back, to rebel. In South Africa, why are people protesting? What's their most common grievance? At the moment, you know, if you look at the media, the government, even academics, the protests in South Africa are labeled service delivery protests. Uh, 
which suggests that they are about basic, the provision of basic services, water, electricity, housing, roads. This is very true, but our study also shows that over and above that, people are worried about unemployment, are worried about their crime, you know, domestic violence, and more importantly, are worried about the quality of democracy in post-apartheid society. So when we list the issues around which people are protesting, number one will be service delivery, number two will be housing, number three, water and sanitation, number four is representation, which means that people are unhappy with the way they are public representatives are putting forward their case. Councillors, mayors, uh, provincial officials, indeed up to the president. So this is the problem, a kind of democracy deficit. I would say that uh, democracy should be more than just formal in the sense of the vote or electing someone to speak on your behalf. It should have substance in the sense that you should be able to see an improvement in your economic well-being. So I think there's a mismatch between that. So people are voting every five years, but they find that their economic situation is not improving. You vote, but you still remain living in a shack. You vote, you still remain unemployed. So people are feeling that maybe their vote, the formal democracy is not delivering you know, in terms of improving their lives. One of the more unfortunate things we've seen is a trend in the growth of police brutality. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, there is certainly an increase in police brutality in the manner in which police are dealing with protesters. There is uh, an intolerance on the part of, uh, the gov of government officials. Mm -hmm. For example, you'll hear a minister, even recently the president himself, suggesting that people who protest are unruly elements and trying to undermine the authenticity or genuineness of their grievances. So over the past 10 or so years, 43 people have been shot dead by police during protests. One of them is Andre Statane, mm -hmm. who got shot in Fixburg in 2011. During that year, uh, seven protesters were, were shot dead. What is really worrying, in fact nine in 2011, what is worrying now, this year 2014, it's hardly a month, two months, and already uh, seven protesters have been shot dead. So I think we're seeing an increasing trend towards using the iron fist against protesters. And why do you think that there's this increased repression of protest? I think that basically the protesters are questioning the quality of the democracy, they are questioning uh, the government's economic policies, but I think that the government is not willing to change. So without any kind of tangible reform you know, in the offing, the tendency is to respond with repression. I think that's the problem. Yet when we read about these protests, which are increasingly getting reported in newspapers, what we're reading about is service delivery protests. I mean, there isn't any deeper analysis or trying to get to grips with the economic issues people are protesting about. Can you comment on that? Protesters, working people actually, their views are often not taken seriously. You know, they are viewed from above, from the top, from the outside. There is no serious desire to get into the minds and ways of lives of the people. Remember, you know, the former Minister of Housing, Tokyo Sikwale, he spent, you know, four hours sleeping in deep slot, and then he came out and said, I now know how people live, which to me, you know, was quite, uh, you know, symbolic of the attitude, you know, because I know Tokyo, he grew up in Soweto, in Zimshop, he knows very well how people live, suddenly he doesn't know. So I think that there is a tendency to actually, you know, deal with ordinary people, especially when they are fighting back uh, some kind of 
mindless mob. It kind of feeds into a frenzy which you know the big bourgeoisie want to spread among ordinary work, uh, middle class people, the upper middle class, that in fact the working class is their enemy. And the idea that when people demand their rights, when people want a living wage, when people want better housing, somehow that is bad for the economy and will jeopardize you know, the living standards of the middle class. And how are protests being organized? Um, are these sporadic incidents or is there a program of education and interaction with people that kind of gets them to mobilize? You know, In terms of uh, the agency and organization, what is interesting is that many of the protests are not organized by political parties, as some have suggested, you know, a kind of conspiracy theory. Yeah, they are about 40% organized by what we call community-based organizations. And then about 20% are organized by, uh, you know, the so-called new social movements. You remember organizations like the TAC, Treatment Action Campaign, but they have a less role in organizing protests than happened, say, at the turn of the century, you know, the year 2000. So I would say that most protests is the committee itself. And then when you look in how it is organized, people come together as the whole community and they actually do not want any political party or organization you know, to claim ownership of the protests. They say, we are the community. And then they'll set up mostly something called a concerned resident committee or a crisis committee Sometimes it's just called a task team. And then it will be around a specific issue. Maybe the pending issue is electricity, you know. And then what will happen is that, uh, for example, in Kahiso, uh, they had quite a, a worked out uh, system. They had three uh, committee structures. One called the commanders, you know, like the executive, which was in charge of the whole protest another called the intelligentsia. These were people dealing with lawyers, with the legal issues, uh, getting contact with journalists, writing press statements, and also working out strategy. And then a third group called the commandos, <laughs> which is like, you know, the action combat squads, people who set up barricades. And then uh, when the people meet, for example, in Pakistan, uh, they call their big meeting, general meeting, the people's parliament. So there's a lot of democracy and organization going on, you know, behind the protests. Some people misunderstand because they are far from the protests. For example, I saw that the union NUMSA had a resolution, you know, NUMSA wants to support these protests now, since it's pulling out of the alliance. But their resolution says the protests are leaderless. So I don't think they are saying that out of spite. It's because they are kind of distanced from the protests. They are not able to see the local dynamics and internal organization which is taking place. Have you noted through your research any increase in protest action that can be linked to the fact that this is an election year in South Africa? Okay, our research, because we've done this over 10 years, does not show a clear link between protest and elections. But obviously there is a link, it's just that maybe it's too complex for us yet to decipher and explain. For example, people think that just before elections, there'll be more protests in order to press the people's demands, you know, as political parties campaign and make promises. But in 2009, what happened is that towards the election, the national election, there wasn't an increase. The increase only came afterwards, after President Zuma had taken power. So we think maybe that people felt that our man is now in power, we must now push our demands on him. But in 2011, during the local government elections, there was a more even increase before, during and after the election. But after the election, most of the protests seemed to be related to the fact that the ANC had promised communities that they could nominate uh, candidates to be councillors but then these uh, candidates were imposed. 
so there was a dissatisfaction with the people who became councillors. So it's a complex issue. There is no clear relationship. But are you saying, though, that there have been more protests under the Zuma administration than under the Mbeki administration? Yeah, in general, uh, I would say so. Yeah, because the, high, the highest number of protests recorded were in 2012. Yeah, that's, that's bang in the middle of Zuma's term. And since then, there's been a slight decrease, but at a rate much higher than most other years before. Trevor and Gwane, thank you so much for joining us at Saxes. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. And remember, if you want more social justice news and analysis, you can get that at our website at saxus.org.za.